What should we as Christians be doing in these end days? No doubt you're looking outside at this culture, at the news, at the things going on, and you'll probably have a question in your mind, what on earth is going on? And if you read the Bible, it'll tell you that what's happening is exactly what's supposed to happen. So that the end game is the seven-year tribulation and the returning of Jesus Christ. The Bible told us in Isaiah that he's the one who tells us, God is the one who tells us the end from the beginning so that we would know that he is him. Jesus said the same couple, same thing on several occasions in the book of Mark. I am he. I'm telling you these things so that when they happen, you'll know I am he. That builds my faith to watch the Bible come alive. And I, I think the only surprise I have is, is that the Bible's the, the Bible is coming true in such amazing detail. I couldn't have even made this up, not to ever believe it was going to happen in my lifetime, and yet it's happening. And we can talk about eschatology, or we could talk about prophecy. We can talk all those things that, we, that, that everybody else is talking about, but that's not the question I asked. My question is, what should we as Christians be doing in the meantime? Because we can't go dig a hole and disappear. We can't run off to the mountains and become a holy huddle and get together and dis we, we have work to do. Jesus told us to go make disciples, to love your neighbors yourself, to pray for your enemies, to do all these things, to, to serve mankind and bring them a knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what he did. And he gave us charge to continue that ministry when he went up to heaven to sit to the right side of his father. So we can't run away. We can't step up and say, well, it's close to the end, so I'm just going to sit on my hands. That's not what God told us to do. Jesus did not tell us to stop, but instead he told us to love and to respect and to build the gospel in the midst of a dying generation, to be salt and light in a, in a, in a horrible situation. And Colossians chapter 1, I often go back here in verse 10, says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. And how do you do that? By being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul tells the Colossians, hey, if you want to please God, you have two mandates. One be fruitful in everything you do. That's expanding the kingdom by using and walking the, walking the, uh, the, the commandment of the Lord. And if you take the Ten Commandments and you knock them down to two, it's love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, the first four. The last six are love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love people. Be fruitful in every good work. And then increase in the knowledge of God. That means you need to understand exactly what God wants you to do. You want to be obedient to what God has asked you to do. And that's written in the Bible. So you should further your knowledge by diving into the very words of God and understanding what he's asking of us in these days. There are instructions in the Bible. Jesus spoke them clearly, and we'll talk about them in a minute. Maybe we should have some drive to do the things he wants us to do because of this verse I find in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. It says, And now, little children, abide in Jesus, that when he appears, we have, ha we have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Well, that's an interesting statement. He says, you need to abide in Jesus. You need to pull yourself inside Jesus. You need to do what Jesus has told you to do. Live a life Jesus has told you to live. Why right? Abide in his love because when he comes, you will give account to what you have been doing here while he's been gone. That's the point of the parable of the talents, which we're going to talk about. You're going to need to stand before Jesus and tell him what you've done. And you don't want to be ashamed. 
You don't want to be ashamed of what you thought about, what you did, the actions, your thoughts, your words. You want those to be indicative of you belonging to Jesus Christ. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says, if you love one another, everyone will know you belong to me. When somebody looks at you, do they see Jesus? Do they hear Jesus? Do they understand your life to be welded into and 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 collected in Jesus's love. That's my desire. And that's the decision that I'm trying to deal with right now. But if we talk about what to do and how to act in the end days, then we should go look for Jesus's instructions. We find them in chapter 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse. Right now, at this point, he just left the temple. He's just ra- he's just railed on the on the Philist- on the uh, on the religious rulers, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he's upset. And the the disciples are trying to kind of clear. I, I think what it sounds like he's trying to kind of get him going again and kind of encourage him. Is like, look at this beautiful temple. And all the buildings that are created around with such wonder. It glowed gold from the sun. It was made beautiful. And Jesus said, all that you see around here is going to be destroyed. And this catches them by surprise. And he starts to give account of what's going to happen in the end. Now, he gives signs and seasons. He gives understandings about what to look for. He doesn't give them a timeline, but we certainly can step back and see the season as it's approaching. We see it right now. So if if anything Jesus says in both 24 and 25 is really, really spot on for the times in which we live, it's right now and it's right here. Here's a little bit of context coming from all of it discourse. In chapter 24, he says in verse 44, therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. All right, that's a truth we need to realize. The Bible doesn't give us a date or a time in which Jesus will return. And he's told us to be diligent in what we're doing. We'll talk about it. Diligent about how we're acting about how we're trying to be fruitful in everything we're doing, how we're trying to deepen a knowledge of God and a knowledge of Jesus Christ, how we're trying to follow the law of God by loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourself. All of that is important because we don't know when he's coming. Although he just told us in earlier parts of Matthew 24 what to look for. In Luke, it says, when you start to see these, when you see these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption draws near. That's close because when we're talking about wars and rumors of wars and deceptions and earthquakes and pestilences and famines and and ethnic divisive ethnic battles and giant kingdoms against each other, which are all happening right this moment, just open the paper and look down the headlines. All of them are there then more and more importantly, we don't know he's coming, but we're in the season. And that should grab you by the heart and turn on your behavior for seeking God right now while you still can, not knowing the day he's coming. It could be in five minutes. Could be in another year. Who knows? But back to the original question, what should we be doing? What should Christians be doing in a time when we're awaiting, eagerly awaiting his arrival, but he hasn't come yet? Well, let's do verse 45. And it says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made him ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. Meaning, it's a blessed, if you are a servant who is doing what the Lord has asked you to do, the, this wise servant, the master leaves, the wise servant is left in control of the household. When the master returns, he's blessed if he's still doing what he's been asked to do. That's just diligent, mature management of the household. 
Now think about it as Jesus being the master and the servant being you. You're his master and he left. He's left you in this place to be diligent enough to take care of his house. You don't know when he's coming back, but when he does, you'll be blessed if you're doing what he's asked you to do. On the other hand, it says in verse 47, Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming. And begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink in the, with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him. And at an hour that is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That last statement, weeping and gnashing of teeth, is a judgment statement. The point is, is if the master goes away and you're left at the house, but you don't think he's coming back, so you use his assets to eat and drink and beat up people and live a sinful life, be a prodigal son, do whatever you want to do instead of being a good, wise uh, steward of the household, he's going to return when you don't expect it and he's going to catch you doing things you shouldn't be doing. You will be so you will stand before the Lord and you will be ashamed of what you've done instead of standing in righteousness like 1 John says over there when we read in 1 John. And judgment will come. We are to stand in righteousness. Back at that John, back at 1 John, it says, And now little children abide in Jesus, that when he appears we have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. It says in 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. It's a picture. Your behavior is indicative of who you belong to. Your behavior is indicative of what you expect from the king. And he is a king. A lot of people think that Jesus is just a nice guy or a prophet or is just a kind teacher. He's coming back as a king. And judgment is in is is judgment is coming with him. If you don't have enough reverence for the king, for who he really is when he comes, I think Psalm 2 says, kiss the son lest he be angry. We have a point to make. We have a king to serve, and we want to follow him and be righteous because when we are righteous, we stand in righteousness. We stand in righteousness, people know we belong to him. I often say this, if you are in the court of law and you are being charged with being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Is there enough evidence in your life to prove to those who are looking on, the judge and jury, that you belong to him? Two kinds of servants, those who are left to be mature stewards of what he's been given and the one who decides to pull shit off because he doesn't believe he's coming back. And he starts into a couple of parables to kind of drive these points home. Now in chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 13 is the parable of the foolish and wise virgins. Now I've done teachings on this before and I'll leave you a, a link to, in the description if you want to go there. But the point of this parable is this. There are 10 women who are virgins. All 10, at this point on a spiritual scale, are Christians. The bridegroom is Jesus. He's going to come back for the rapture of the church. And when the rapture happens, those he takes with him will go up to the wedding feast in heaven for seven years. That's just written in the book of Revelation. We know this to be true. But what happens is five of those women are ready to go when he comes. They have oil in their lamps and they're ready. The other five decided that it was going to be delayed, that the bridegroom wasn't coming, that he was not that he was not on time and so they let their they let their the oil burn out in their lamps and they're not ready when he comes. The five that are ready go with them. The five that are not ready have to go get oil. And when they come back, it's over. He's gone. The five 
wise virgins are gone and the five foolish virgins are left here. The point of the whole thing is, is that you need to be studying. You need to be prepared. The Holy Spirit is a picture of the, of, of the, the oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And it rests inside us as we prepare, deepen our knowledge of Jesus Christ and, and be caught so doing the things he's asked us to do when he returns. We must be ready, our eyes to the skies, doing what we do. In the Passover, they, God told Moses, tell the people to eat with their cloak on, eat with their shoes on, because you're getting out of here in a hurry. You better be ready because the Passover is coming. By the way, the Passover's on Monday. Who knows what might happen? It's probably good that you're prepared for whatever comes next. Now, here's what's interesting. The last verse in that parable says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. More of that talk. I don't know when he's coming. I don't know the day or the hour. Nobody knows when he's going to come and take the, the bride away. The bride, the church. Those who are born again and locked in, sealed with the Spirit. Now, the word watch therefore means... You've got to be ready. You have to be paying attention. You should be praying. You should be ready. You should be studied up. You should be full of the Spirit. All these things. But these are all these are all points to be ready. So when we're looking at this parable, it's a parable about being ready. But it doesn't really tell you any more about what readiness means. What does being ready really mean? What should I be doing? That's the question that we started off here as Christians in this time period, what should be what we should what should we be doing? Well, that's when it starts in verse fourteen. That's the parable of the talents, and this is the one that helped me to understand and to answer some deep-hearted questions I've had these last few days to whether I need to work and be diligent now or be diligent to deal with something in the future. Here's what it says. Jesus is speaking. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servant, his servants, and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to, and to another one to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Now, let's stop back and talk about parables. Jesus uses parables. They're stories that are fictional, but they have spiritual meanings to it. So when he's speaking of a very normal thing, I'm a, I am a master of a program. I have some I have some servants. I'm going to do something. I'm going to give my wealth to my servants to protect and invest while I go away for a long period of time. Protects my money. It allows them to create me more wealth while I'm gone. If I can trust these men to do it. That's what's happening here. But the, st the, but the deeper spiritual meaning is, is Jesus left and he left these servants, Christians, with his wealth. Now, what is his wealth? Well, it's all the things that we've been given because everything comes from above. It's stuff like your time or your money or your abilities or your authorities and it comes of your spiritual gifts as well. God gives us what we have so that we can use them to further the kingdom. No, a large percentage of the population uses the stuff God has given them for themselves. And this hence becomes the first question you should ask yourself. It was the question that changed my mind. And what the question is, is do you look at the stuff that you have as a steward or an owner? Are you a steward of what God said or are you an owner of what God gave you? I really like this. Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham says this. Even as he sets the stage, Jesus is telling us something important. We have an entrustment. Everything we have is given to us by God. Do we see ourselves as stewards or owners? The answer makes 
all the difference. A steward lives for the day. He will return the master's goods to him. An owner believes his possessions are his to spend in any way he sees fit. All we have are material goods, our abilities, and even our very lives belong to someone else. We're merely holding them for the day of reckoning. That changes. That question, are you a steward or are you an owner, changes everything. Because it makes a difference what I do. Do I see my time, my abilities, my money, my retirement, my, my technology, my ministry? My, do I see any of this belonging to me and it's mine to do with what I please? Or does it belong to God and I'm just using it, being a, being a good steward of it, knowing that he's going to come and, and fix the account? He's going to settle it up. And I'm going to be questioned about what I did with his stuff. It's interesting. The word delivered in the New King James Version, verse 14, he says, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them, has the idea of stewarding it to them. The idea here is, is I, I didn't give you this for you. I'm giving it to you to work with so that you could give it back to me later. And that's a different kind of maturity. That's a different kind of trust. If you understand that God has given everything you have, and the Bible says he owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills, he needs nothing. He's allowed you to have it so you could be good stewards with it. How are you going to use it? That's the question we've been asking. What are you going to do for the, for the Lord based on the things that you have, your life resources? Your time, your money, your abilities, your authority, your spiritual gifts. He's given it to you for a good reason. What are you going to do with them? He says, this man went to a far kingdom. Now he divvied it up amongst three servants. And I want you to notice something here. He gave one five talents. He gave two talents to another. And to one third guy, he gave one talent. Now, don't think for a moment that one talent is one coin and it's minuscule. When we're talking about a talent, we're talking some upwards of 6,000 days of work. It's still a substantial amount of money. Now, it's not five, it's not five talents, which is upwards of over 100,000 days of work. It's only 6,000 days of work. It's still a substantial number. By the way, God divvies up to people in different ways. There are different amounts that all of us have, mainly because some of us shouldn't be trusted with tremendous amounts of money. Others should not be trusted with very little because we're all different and we have all different kinds of personalities and gifts. I was reminded of Romans chapter 12. Verse 3, it says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't think you're more special than anybody else. But to think soberly, be humble, as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. And this is kind of an idea that we're talking about here. The man that gets five talents was given a greater measure of faith greater measure of gifts, greater measure of accomplishment, greater measure of, of, you know, with great power comes great responsibility with great tools and great wealth and great are just higher responsibility. Not all of us can do that. And it says here, don't think you're special because you got five talents and that guy only got two talents. Think soberly because God's given it to you. You have higher responsibility. He continues and he says in verse four, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do have the same function, don't have the same function. They do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having the gifts differing, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, our ministry, 
Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives, give with liberality. He, will, <clears throat> he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. He says, look, don't think because you've been given an opportunity, you're better than someone else because someone else doesn't have your opportunity. Maybe you've been blessed with tremendous amounts of wealth. That's a responsibility you need to do something with. That's when it says, well, if you have the gift of giving, give liberally. He gave liberally to you so you could give liberally to everyone else. Because we're supposed to be fruitful in everything that we do and get a, and get a deeper knowledge of God to please God. Paul says we're not all of the same we're all of the same body but we don't do all the same functions and so why would we all have different numbers and types of talents Don't believe for a moment that if you're a pastor and you stand behind the pre the pulpit you're more important than the guy who's cleaning the bathrooms you're not And the great importance the most vital organs are the organs you can't see inside the body so he says, so he says he's given people different measures of talents. Now the word talent at this point was a measure of money. But talents now can be your talents. Are you talented in something and are you using it for the Lord? Some people are just more talented, have more, have a greater appreciation of their talents than others. Doesn't make us better or worse, doesn't make us higher or lower in God's eyes. It's just how God decided through his sovereignty to decide it. So it says then, <clears throat> he, that's the landowner. Well, it says, it says verse 15, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to one another one, to each according to his own ability. And then immediately he went on a journey. We don't know when he's coming back. So he's given all of this wealth to these three guys to do something to better himself while he's gone. Nobody knows when he's coming back. Verse 16, then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he had received two, gained two more also, but... He who had received one went and dug it in the ground and he hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled with them. Now the point is this. It says settled accounts with them, which means they knew it wasn't a gift. They knew that he was going to come back and settle accounts. It wasn't a here, here's five talents for just because I love you and I'm leaving and then you do whatever you want. No, I'm going to give you something so that you go and better my estate. When I come back, I'll settle up the account with you. Remember, are you a steward of the things that you have or are you an owner of the things that you have? It's how we think about that that should be kind of directing our decisions. Well, verse 20, he settles up the accounts and it says, so he who had received five talents came and brought him other talents, um, brought five other talents saying, Lord, you've delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful for over a few things and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and he said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. There's a very specific couple things to point out here. One, the guy that was given more talents made more talents. And he was given a tremendous reward. This is the reward I look to, to gain. When I stand before the Lord and he said, well done, good and faithful servant. It doesn't say well done, good and intelligent or highly, you know, highly... Um, He doesn't say, 
you're incredibly powerful. It doesn't say you're incredibly intelligent. He doesn't say you're incredibly rich. He doesn't say you're incredibly effective servant. He just says faithful. Well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you a little bit and you were faithful. I'll give you a lot. And then enter into my joy. Come be with me in my joy. That's the only thing I seek after to find. To look into Jesus' eyes when I stand before him. He says, well, God done, good and faithful servant. I have made you faithful with little. <coughs> I'll give you more. Enter into my joy. To see the color of his eyes and hear his voice will move me to tears. The tears of happiness that it talks about the Bible. Talks about the tears of joy. We also see that the guy who was only given two, who only brought back two, that was only half. The first guy now had ten. He only had four. Very big gap of unperformance. Certainly a underperformer, but that's not what happens in this story. Jesus here, or the landowner says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with little. Now I'll give you much. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Same. He gets the same reward. He had less. He produced less. He's still seen as faithful. The point here is, is it doesn't matter how much you have. Are you being faithful with what you have? That's the question. If you lived in a cardboard box on the corner, but you stood on the corner and you shared the gospel and prayed with people and you encouraged people in the name of the Lord, you're being faithful with what you've been given. And oh, how big your, your jump into God's joy would be. The Bible makes it kind of clear that you can have your heaven now or you can have your heaven later. That's up to you. You can, you can sit on the temporal stuff now and press on to the sinfulness and the wickedness and the, the seeking after all the eat and drink and be merry and be prodigal and do all that stuff that you desire to do in your heart, leaving Jesus out. You can do that now. That'll be your heaven. And then when he comes to settle accounts, you'll be like the third guy here. Where you can take a little bit of a leap of faith, put down all of that creature comfort temporal stuff that we have going on right now, especially now, and start doing things that using your resources to further the gospel, to further the kingdom of God, what you pull out of that, this joy of the Lord and everything that comes with it, you'll have for eternity in heaven where you can enjoy it. A little pain now, and that's tremendous investment later. Well, what happens to the third guy? In verse 24, it says, Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent on the ground. Look, there you have is what is yours. Boy, this didn't go well. Maybe he saw... He saw the other guys had far more talents and he said, you're a rich guy and you got all these other guys that are working so hard. I, whatever, I, whatever little talent that I have here isn't worth anything. It's not going to amount to anything. Why should I even try? So he does very minimal work. It's not like he just threw it away. He buried it so that it would be safe. Just had to remember where it was. And he pulls it out of the ground and he says, here, have what's yours. Because you got everything. You got it all. Maybe he's jealous of what the landowner meant. Maybe he's angry that the landowner has it better than him. Maybe he's he feels oppressed or a victim because, because he's living a life that is of servitude. Either way, all of these things can be true in today's society. I don't have enough, so forget it. 
I don't have enough influence, so forget it. There are people doing far more than me, so forget it. I mean, think about it. If all three servants were put together in a in one group, then look how many they have. 10 plus 4 plus 1 is 15. They started out with 8, and now they have 15. Pretty good return. But, but judgment comes individually. He comes to each of those men, says, you were faithful with what I gave you, or you were not faithful with what I gave you. And there's coming a day we'll stand before Jesus when this happens, and you will be asked to give account. Hebrews says we are naked and open for the one standing before the one who is to give account. He knows everything we're doing. So this guy goes and he buries his one talent. And he could have had the same reward, these guys, if he had just been diligent to do something with his talent. But he buries it in the sand. Maybe he's worried about persecution, being mocked, being yelled at. Being... Maybe he's afraid of the fear of man. Maybe he's... his friends didn't like his faith. So he went and he buried it and he went and ran off and did other things that didn't further the kingdom. Whatever it is. He comes back to the steward and he says, I, you're a hard man. And you asked me to do things that I, you didn't give me what's needed to do. I don't, I'm afraid. And I was afraid of losing it. So I didn't step out in faith to use what you'd given me to do something better with it. So take what's yours. <laughs> Look what he says in verse 26, but... His Lord answered and he said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I would reap where I had not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. You know that I would want more than I've given out. You know that I am a person who is seeking to increase the kingdom. You know that I am someone <coughs> who seeks to, to empower so that I'm made better. Does God have the right to seek that? You know what I gather where I have not scattered seeds, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. See, what he says is, is he says, oh, if you had you just known, had you had you just believed in me at all, and maybe you maybe you had a misconception about who I am, okay. But at least take what I gave you and put it in the bank. Let somebody else do the work. Let somebody else use the money and make interest. And then when I came back, I'd have a little bit more. The way I look at this is. At least live your life that looks like a Christian. There are so many people out there that say that they're Christian, but they don't act like it. It's just a name. I get to the point I can't even use Christian anymore because so many people are Christians who aren't. Now you got to be a believer in Christ because that's a little bit more pointed because the people won't make that statement. But they're going to use that word just so you feel better about them. Maybe you'll trust them more. But they take that word and then they take that talent that they've been given by God because they've asked him to be their savior and then they bury it somewhere and they go and they live for the world. There's going to be a, a time when the, set, the account is settled. If you think you can stand up and say a prayer, live your life the way it is the wet rest of your life and then stand before the Lord and say, well, I, I said a prayer. You're sadly mistaken. Because it isn't about the prayer we said. It's what our belief is in our heart. And if you don't want to work for the Lord, the spirit should rest in there. It should, it should bear witness with your spirit and drive you to want to be better. But if you don't, question your salvation. Those are strong words in a time when everybody thinks all I have to do is say it. And I'm once saved, always saved. The question is, were you ever saved to begin with? Because Jesus says there's work to be done and the Spirit will lead you to do it. 
But if you take that little talent that I've given you and you don't even at least acknowledge my presence, acknowledge in your behaviors, at least walk around with a little bit of light on your head and take it to the, the banker and get connected with a church who is at least doing good things about it. You don't have to do it yourself. Just do something for me. So many people are afraid or don't want to or they don't want to read the Bible, or they don't want to pray, or they don't want to get close, or they don't want to bear fruit, or they don't want to do any of that, and, it, and it's indicative of their life. I'm passionate about this because we're running out of time. We're reading the time in which we should be acting, and that time is now. So, Christian, what should you be doing? See, what we're looking at is the sin of omission. What did you not do? The Bible tells us there's two kinds of sin, omission and commission. If I go rob a bank, that's the sin of commission. I went and committed a robbery. But if I didn't give CPR to someone who's laying there, I've sinned by omission. I didn't do something to try and save someone's life. Did you know that the only sin that will drive you into hell that cannot be forgiven is the sin of omission because you failed. You sinned by omitting Jesus from your life. See, we have to accept Jesus and his gift. It tells us in John chapter three that he didn't come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. Adam and Eve condemned the world. Jesus came to put it back up. So what happened was when Adam and Eve had sinned, nobody had a choice. Everyone was condemned. But when Jesus came and died on the cross for the sins of the world, that took that part out of the equation. Now you have a choice. You choose Jesus or you choose the world. It's still a choice you have to make. You have to accept Jesus into your heart by faith. Repent of your sinful behaviors. Try to do better. Get to know him better. Bear fruit better. Use your, your talents and resources and your spiritual gifts to better, the, to better the kingdom, the kingdom of God. This is the message for today. We have to realize that there are actions by which we can take. Look at verse 29. It says, For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will, be, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth is a picture of hell. Because this person who did not take his talent and use it for the kingdom never was saved in the first place. He chose the world. He chose himself. He knew he wasn't the owner of it and he didn't want to help his steward out. And he didn't want to build his steward's kingdom. And he didn't want to build his steward's wealth. So he buried it so he didn't have to do anything about it. And he went on with his life. But to be a follower of Christ, you can't do that. Salvation comes by faith. That is indeed true. You can't work for your salvation, but your behavior afterwards should be indication that you are saved. James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. It's not my works that, met, that, that earn it. I am earned and therefore my works will prove it to the world. Because I said, I'm standing on a platform and people are watching me, watching what I think, watching what I do, watching what I say. And they're going to make a decision about Christianity based on what I'm doing. So what am I doing with myself? I need to take my assets, my time, my abilities, my authorities, my spiritual gifts, and I need to go and make a big, I have to go and deepen my knowledge of God and be fruitful in every good work, everything that I do to further the kingdom and bring people into the kingdom. Because time is short. 
Jesus is speaking of the end times. What should we be doing? We should be doing the king's business, just as he himself quoted right here. Be faithful, be a steward, and let's get some work done. Makes the time short. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Be blessed.